focus this last session on the future. Uh, that is the next decade. Um, what are we going to do next? And to help us think about this, to help us sum up this day, we are joined by Betty Reardon, the Grand Dame of Peace Education and founding director of the International Institutes on Peace Education. We are also joined by two scholars, activists, and partners, Sanam Manderlini, the founding director of ICANN in the International Civil Society Network, and Carla Coppel, the director of the Institute for Inclusive Security. Now, this panel would, of course, not be complete without a man. Indeed, <laughs> it has been an underlying theme, I think, of this day that we have to engage men. And we thank Jimmy Briggs for joining us in this panel. <laughs> Jimmy is a prize-winning journalist and the founder of the Man Up campaign, for which he received an award from JQ. So with that... We're going to make this session, we hope, lively, <laughs> quick, and uh, we have 29 minutes, just so <laughs> you know. <laughs> really, we want to do is take some of the themes of today and, and bring them forward and get some reactions from our uh, panelists of experts. You know, one of the things that has happened today that people have brought back into the conversation is the role of education. And Betty, nobody has done peace education like you. You put it on the map. It's still on the map. What do you see for the future right now? The things that you've heard today about 1325, how can education make a difference moving forward? I think that um, education is actually the, the most essential part And by that, I don't mean simply formal instruction. I mean intentional planned learning. I mean setting forth some goals in terms of what we believe the population should know about these issues and what we need to do to be able to equip them to uh, be participants in the uh, implementation of 1325 to be participation to be participants uh, in the changes that we know are, are needed. Um, had we more time, I would outline a curriculum plan, <laughs> which I happen to have for uh, going toward the future. But I think the most important thing that uh, we have to start to learn about uh, has come out in many of the uh, presentations we've heard today in one way or another, uh, particularly, I think, in uh, our Sudanese sister's definition of what makes a woman secure, and in Abby's talking about the nature of war, and that is that we have a huge structural planning and design task ahead to replace war with other ways of doing conflict and protecting our interests. And uh, so I think the future is about participating in envisioning that change, participating in change, learning to use the tools we have, such as 1325. Thank you, Betty. That is actually a phenomenal outline of, uh, of next steps, and we uh, look forward to looking and reading and engaging in this curriculum that you're talking about. I'm going to turn to my right here to Sanam. I feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> And she's sitting there, what question are you going to answer? <laughs> Ask the audience. Ask the audience, that's right. Call a friend. You know, one of the things that uh, we think about a lot at the Institute of Peace is how to put peace in a package. And what do I mean by that? How do you put something like 1325, which has so much content, into a three to four second elevator ride between the second floor and the fourth floor. Sanam, I can't think of more, any more articulate person than you, Sanam. Can you give us that 
<laughs> bumper sticker that, really that puts me on the spot. <laughs> I would say how, how are we going to do this elevator speech I would this say week? It's don't reward violence, reward peace. So, and by that I mean that it's just not enough to bring armed actors, whether they are state or uh, non-state actors, to the table because they have been the most violent at the moment. Basically, why aren't women at the table? Women aren't at the table because they're not a security threat. That's it. Okay. If the women of Afghanistan started lobbing bombs around and being dangerous, <laughs> they would be escorted to the talks in Kabul tomorrow. Okay. That's that's. I'm sorry. That's a fact. Right. But we are perhaps more evolved. I'm not sure. But women are not <laughs> willing to take up arms as we, you know. We we join armed groups, but we don't we don't do it on our as for ourselves. So. The issue is that we have to change the paradigm to recognize, legitimize, give credit to the courage of people who are willing to sit on opposite sides of the table and talk about their big differences. Turid mentioned the Israeli-Palestinian women. They got together when it was illegal to do so. They brought the issue of a two-state solution. They were the first ones, the women of Israel and Palestine were the first ones to come up with the idea of a two-state solution and make it public. Now that idea is out there. The women are saying something else, by the way, then. But they, they are excluded. And I think that, that 1325 and the U.S. national action planning process should really be about reframing how we look at issues to put human security and peace as the, as the vision. That's what we want. Those are the ideals of the U.S. that the rest of the world aspires to. It's the most powerful ideals that the U.S. has that no other country, I think, has. And we just need to make peace to reward peace. We, that, that's, I, I can't think of anything else. Peace, activism, peaceful engagement has to be rewarded in ways that it's never been done before, so before. I knew you could do it somehow. Yeah, bumper sticker. <laughs> it was a bit of a anyway. Well, I think we're on the 50th floor now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the other theme of today is how to connect the big picture to the day-to-day -day survival. And I think today we have had some of the very top officials of the U.S. government, the U.N., the international organizations, and civil society. And Carla, I'm going to turn to you to help us because in your role as executive director of the Institute of Inclusive Security, you are constantly looking at connecting the dots, big picture, and then the day-to-day. -day. And I know you've done this uh, most recent study and uh, program in DRC that's about to be launched tomorrow at the program called The Trouble with the DRC. Can you help us bring those story points together? Well, I think the fundamental message is that you're not going to get protection without participation. And that's going to be true at the broadest level, and that's going to be true on the ground. If you're talking about Congo and you're saying how do you deal with sexual violence and how do you address the problems that women and children and some men are facing, it's going to take not only protection of those women but involvement in those, of those women in providing, designing, and implementing a solution. The same is going to be true around negotiations. Sanam talks about how you approach that peace process. It's connecting those peacemakers to the broader process above, involving them in the process of deciding how you bring protection home. So it's quite a fundamental concept that needs to move forward as we reach this pivot point in time where we've completed one decade of 1325 and we're moving forward with a second decade. We've got the rhetoric. Now we need to move forward with the implementation. And a lot of people today have talked about how we do that. And it's simply about making a concerted effort to change the way we make policy and program and to do that from the highest level down to the grassroots level. Thank you very much, Carla. Jimmy? Yesterday <laughs> and again today, <laughs> Margot Wallstrom talked about that sexual violence is neither sexual or cultural, but criminal. She also said, sexual violence in war is cheap, silent, and effective. Can you, in your role as Man Up, talk about how this particular part of war uh, can be interrupted, how we can intervene, and how you think 
uh, we need to move forward with both men and women together. I was hoping that you would not ask me the heaviest question this <laughs> round. Um, no, I, this is something I thought about a lot. Uh, before working on this issue actively as part of Man Up, I was a journalist in places like Congo, Afghanistan, Guatemala, Colombia. So I did have some some first-hand experience, you know, from that, from that place. And I, th I think one of the crucial things, which has been mentioned, um, one, addressing impunity. And I think in the Congo particularly, we're seeing how the prevalence of impunity uh, really feeds into the cycle of sexual violence, even when the war anomaly or for formally is supposed to be over. Also, I think, um, going to the point of men, um, men have to be educated on, on initiatives like 1325, but also provided the space to work on the issue. I know in the Congo, you have groups like Women for Women, and you have you know, local NGOs, which are working to, on a very grassroots level, working to educate men community by community to make them understand you know, why this violence is affecting all of them, but also uh, some of the authority they have in stopping it, even when they're not actively participating in that. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, 1325, and it has been mentioned in some of the previous panels, uh, is not just about what happens over there. It's also very much about what happens here. And I think particularly in the context of the national action plan that is uh, uh, going to be put into place, uh, what are some of the challenges here do you see? And maybe Carla and, and Sanam, you might want to speak to that. Uh, what are some of the challenges and what is the type of advice that you would give uh, to uh, the government as they move along on this, on this journey? I go first. Um, uh, first of all, don't reinvent the broken wheel. Um, what we know is we have 23 countries that have national action plans. Twelve of them are European. And in our report, one of the things that we found was that an assessment of those, uh, of those action plans basically showed that they don't have goals, they don't have measurable indicators, they don't have funding. Essentially, they are plans of aspiration and not of action. So don't do what those guys did. Uh, learn from it and, and move on. So that, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that um, the U.S. deciding to do a national action plan on 1325 is a very serious issue. Um, first of all, because it signals to the world that this matters. But secondly, because the U.S., to be honest with all of you, and, and we all know this, the U.S. Is, a, is probably one of the biggest uh, actors involved in war making right now. Ten years ago, it wasn't. So it's going to have an impact in terms of what it is doing around the world. And, and if, we're, if it's not going to, if this action plan is just cosmetic, then fine, it's cosmetic and it doesn't really mean anything. But if it's going to be something that really has value, it does have implications in terms of what we're doing in Afghanistan now and Pakistan and and and, you know, Iran in the future and, and, and so forth. So I, it has massive implications, I think. So what I would say is work with us in civil society to, to frame it and, and allow the voices of our partners, as they said, from the countries, you know, the sneeze and the, and the, and the flu um, syndrome. Let that, let that come together. Um, put, put, it, put the resources to it. Um, and use it as an opportunity to, to really change the paradigm internationally as well. I, th I, think, I think it's a huge, huge opportunity for changing the way we address 21st century problems. So I, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here at a time when the U.S. is doing this. At the same time, um, you know, I'm, I'm also very concerned because we just don't want it to be, uh, you know, a nice piece of paper and, and, and a way of protecting our, uh, the way we've been doing business as usual. This is a fundamental change for business as usual. Patty, you wanted to add something? Betty, you want uh, no, to No, wait, uh, after uh, okay. she has Carla? responded. <laughs> well, I'm a glass half full kind of gal. So I'm going to say, because I see a lot of our allies within the U.S. government out there, that I think this presents an enormous opportunity. And that as uh, civil society representatives here on the stage today, uh, I think we're here to help you and to work together and to think this through and to figure out how to make it really meaningful and magnificent and transformative. And uh, the bumper sticker in terms of how you, how you do that, I think that there are two pieces. Um, one is focus on institutional change. Uh, and, and there are two pieces to that, in my opinion. Um, 
One is about personnel. How are people's job descriptions written and on what basis are they evaluated and how do you insert this throughout the process of the whole bureaucracy? Um, the second is contracting and funding. How do you approach that contracting process? How do you hold others accountable? How do you make the funding available to the wonderful civil society leaders who are on the last panel? How do you, how do you lower those barriers to entry for all of those other actors? Um, and the third is to, to man up and to, to make some mandates and some directives that will make this meaningful, to say we're not going to allow the kind of exclusion that has gone on for a long time continue ad infinitum into the future. So those are the institutional changes. And the second group of changes I think are absolutely critical and that go hand in hand is training. And that is training, whether it is training for troops, and I know Admiral uh, McMullen, I know that several of the ambassadors earlier today, I know Don Steinberg and others all talked about this, Training pre-deployment, meaningful training, not tacked on training as part of human rights <coughs> training that's one hour in between riflery practice. Um, train all of our foreign service officers. Train the people who are going out into the field. Raise our capacity to understand and to implement the programs on the ground and in turn help the beneficiaries and the partners that we have on the ground through providing them training that will enable us to leverage their expertise, which may not sound exactly like what we're looking for right now, but is incredibly meaningful. If we develop an action plan for the United States that really embraces those kind of transformative moves and works its way from the highest level all the way through, we can make an enormous, enormous difference. I am also looking at that question from the perspective of uh, an educator, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me how ill-informed our people are of the conse- by, uh, by that I mean the American citizenry, of the consequences of our actions on the everyday lives of other people around the world. So that I would hope that uh, the USIP, from which I recently received a beautiful <coughs> mailing about the Peace Links classroom, and I began to think about what could take place in that classroom. And I think this would be one thing is to begin to get people uh, to really have a better global understanding in terms of the consequences of choices and actions and policies. The other thing is training, yes, but also the initial education. We need to have gender education as part of peace education, and we need to be working on the education of both men and women, boys and girls, about the possibilities for complementarity in their roles and about the essential quality of humanity in both men and women and that until we have that equality recognized, we're not going to have a real true peace. Jimmy, are you going to take up this uh, issue in the Mm -hmm. ManUp campaign? Well, we already have. I mean, the focus of the campaign is um, engaging and working within people broadly, male and female. So you know, we're working now in 25 countries, 25 more next year, um, edu- providing a basic education um, on issues such as those being discussed here, but also, you know, something which I think was mentioned earlier at lunchtime with the, with the men, with the young men in particular, uh, talking about masculinity and manhood. You know, I was, I was reflecting um, when Admiral Mullen was speaking because um, about the implementation of 1325 and, and how what it means for American citizens. And, and you know, and the journalist in me, I have to be honest with you, um, you know, I'm, I'm half glass, half full, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, you know, unfortunately, you know, I live in a country where, you know, resolution 1325 is one thing. But most young Americans, most Americans, know so little or understand very little about the Constitution of this country. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, there's a basic education that's done to be taught um, formally and informally in whatever institutions that we can engage, whether it's schools, community centers, churches, whatever. Wonderful. 
You know, we have a few minutes left, and uh, we want to keep this dialogue going. And I know there are questions and comments from uh, the audience. And so at this moment, we'll uh, open it up for any questions. You know where the uh, microphones are, and uh, we look forward to your thoughts. Just introduce yourself, and if you can keep your comments to a very brief remark. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Johnson. And I actually would like to see as an action item from the week of activities, if we could push in Sudan as a current case of conflict, a way to implement Resolution 1325 right now. It just occurred to me in spending the day here in the room that it's so easy for us to look back and say all that we could have done for X or Y or Z conflict. But since we have so many on the planet right now that we can take action on, and we have Sudanese leaders in the room, to be able to perhaps push with the Ambassador Gratian from the USA side, as well as the person who represents the United Nations, to bring greater level of female participation now in the case of Sudan. So please let us know, Kathleen, if that would be possible as an action item from this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a fourth question? Please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is I can't see you, but I can hear you. (laughs) (laughs) My name is Afia Evans with Evidence-Based Research. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for all of your comments. Um, I just want to make a comment, noticing that we're in the time where we're talking about action items and where we're going in the future, and most of the people that were here earlier are not here. And I think that maybe that's one of the issues that we may be having in translating it from paper to actually policy that we talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, but then when time comes to actually do something, we're unavailable. So I was wondering, is there anything that is being planned perhaps as a follow-up to this event, a way to bring some of the people together that were here earlier today? I mean, you know, I got some cards, I talked, I networked, I whatever, but (laughs) are we all going to get together and actually really do something about that, or or is there anything being planned for a follow-up? Thank you. Well, I, speaking for the panel, um, I will say I am very determined to continue the community of practice. But I will tell you, I don't exactly know how the community of practice will continue forward, but it will be going forward. I think it is somewhat a creative process. It depends on the people, the interests, the suggestions that are made, but there is a strong commitment, and I think this three-day conference where we have sold out every single event, says there is action and commitment all blended together, and we will continue to create opportunities to convene and move these uh, ideas into action and measurable action. Please. My name is Teresa Delangis. I think I asked the second question this morning. I'm going to ask the same question now. Um, I completely agree with the panel's assessment that 1325, a national action plan for the U.S., has um, transformative possibilities for internationally because we are engaged in so many different conflicts. And I also want to um, pick up on something that Sanam said in terms of the U.S. in many ways being a war, a place in conflict. We are a country in conflict. We have two. We at least have um, Afghanistan. I don't hear any, I don't hear the panelists speaking to what 1325 could do as part of a domestic agenda. So yes, it's definitely an international agenda, but I can't imagine in Afghanistan, for example, having a 1325 action plan and not pressing for more women's political activism or participation as one example. What could the 1325 action plan do here domestically um, and what difference would that make worldwide? I'm going to open that up to the panel. I think it's an important question. Uh, Sanam, would you like to I'm just... Gonna, I'm going to ask. Is it, is, can, okay. Do you, want to, do you want to go first? Do I want to start? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, domestically, I, I, I've only lived in the U.S. for nine years, and, and every year that I've been here, I find it a more confusing place to be. So um, it, it's... Uh, I, I think that, that um, what Betty mentioned about 
informing and educating the public is, is definitely a part of it. Mm -hmm. I think looking at budgets and where money goes is, is a part of it. Um, we are not funding conflict prevention, for example. We are not funding peace properly, for example. Even the commitments that have been made today and, and last week in terms of money going to DRC or, or Afghanistan, it's really a, a drop in the ocean. I mean, it's a lot of money for, for the kind of work that it's going to get done, but it's, but it's a drop in the ocean in the, in the larger budget. So I would love to see the, the, the funds reviewed in, in a serious way in terms of how we tilt it to make prevention, nonviolent transformation, and, and as I said, peace, peace groups and so forth more, uh, more uh, supported. I'd love to see a discussion here about, and I, and I do think it has to start in the domestic kind of diplomatic, academic, scholarly field and, and then taken forward. I would love to see us develop criteria for civil society participation in peace processes so that it's not arbitrary, so it, that it's not people being able to accuse me of being elite or not representative or whatever, but saying, okay, we're coming forward. A group of Sudanese women are coming forward. If they are supporting the, the, the if they're offering constructive uh, uh, solutions, if they are engaging with all the parties, if they're talking across the conflict lines, why shouldn't they have a legitimate role in the negotiations? They can hold their own fighters accountable. These are the kinds of things that we can start domestically here that have an implication on both the domestic agenda, I think, but also in the, the role of the U.S. internationally. It's very hard for me as a, as a foreigner to, to separate the, U, the role of the U.S. Inter, domestically and internationally because as a, anything that happens here has an impact somewhere else. You know, it just, the NRA gets involved in, in negotiations at the UN around uh, arms control in Sierra Leone. I mean, it, it's, it's a crazy way that, that the U.S. domestic agenda is out there. And so um, I, I don't, I think it's very hard to, to, to separate these things, but I do think that we can start with setting standards and ideals and modeling it, very much modeling it. And going back to the Sudan question, I would say the same thing with Afghanistan. Why are we not putting women in the negotiations now? I would say the same thing with Israel and Palestine. Why are we not meeting with the women? Why do we keep bringing the same guys to talk and, and stop at the same place and making it conflict management? Um, so it, each of those conflicts has a domestic agenda, obviously. So I, it's, I, don't, I don't think we, could, we should separate them, but I do think that it, what we do out there has impl impact here and what we do here has an impact in terms of how the world sees us uh, as well and treats us as well. Thank you. Sanam Betty. Well, I think under the right circumstances, it could uh, be a, a very, if you pardon the expression, revolutionary kind of document because um, it has to me, when I, when I look at the history of 1325 and the visions that we had when we were thinking about it, it could have, uh, I think, the valence of, a, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because it becomes a vehicle for us to begin to think about all the things that, the specifics we've been talking about, but what is meant by peace and security? Um, what do we mean for, uh, to have a peaceful society in the United States? How does that peaceful society in the United States uh, become an actor in, in the world? What kind of actor do we want to be in the world? And then the, the most essential thing is this uh, point of not simply uh, having e equality in the negotiations and so forth, but in the defining of security, because that, I think, is the most significant thing that women can bring because you define the world the way you experience the world. And I have to tell you this, that I, I, I read uh, two or three weeks ago a little headline that said, uh, Leonardo Boff says women are going to uh, save the world. Well, my answer that I told the, PS, uh, uh, the Peace and Justice Study was, no, Leonardo, we're not. <laughs> We've been doing that for centuries. <laughs> you guys got to put your shoulders to the wheel and work with us. That's all we're asking for. And the work has to be about security. And women have to be involved in defining security. Unfortunately, the clock is ticking, and we're coming to the end of, uh, I think, this extraordinary day. 
uh, there's much more to talk about, and uh, I can assure you that we will uh, organize other events and, and brainstormings. Uh, but we've also come to uh, the end of the day, and I'd like you to join me in, in recognizing uh, the help of all the volunteers uh, from USIP and our partner organizations without whom we could not have organized this day. And I'd like to ask the volunteers to stand up so that we can recognize you and thank you. And in particular, I would like to thank Brooke Stedman, who is the right hand of Kathleen Keenest. Um, of course, all this would not have been possible without the extraordinary leadership uh, of my friend and colleague, Kathleen Keenest. And I would like, I would like to invite Kim Weichler and, of Peace by Peace and Marie-Laure Poiré of Women in International Security to join us uh, and to thank you on behalf of the partners for your extraordinary leadership. Well, thank there you were, very uh, much. I, I, this is a real uh, community effort. No, really. There were 12 organizations that came together to put this uh, conference on. We represented government, international institutions, and NGOs. It was a very, very positive experience, and I think the collective wisdom and breadth and depth of experience really made this a much richer experience. But it was successful because of the leadership of Kathleen Kunst. She provided an inclusivity, uh, generosity, graciousness, and capable leadership, and we really, really want to thank her. So we have several gifts for her, one of which is on behalf of my organization, Peace by Peace, and we raise and multiply women's voices and, and bridge divides. This book is called 60 Years, 60 Voices, and it's Voices of Women in the Middle East. It's been signed by the author, and we uh, honor you. Thank you, Kathleen. And Thank you very well. much. <laughs> okay, I've never had anything like this happen because... But, I, I accept it all graciously, but really, it couldn't happen with all of us. And thank you very much. And I have to t say, if we're going to trade, thank yous. You know, my other hand is right there, Chantal Dungel-Uldrat, and she is a marvelous colleague. So thank you so much to all of you, the leadership of our institute, again, Tara Sonnenschein, and to the Ritz for all of their accommodations today. And uh, here's going forward and to the next time we're going to meet. Thank you so much. Thank you.